Thank you so much. That's really lovely. Oh God, I hope I live up to that. Um, it hasn't it been fantastic to be on the lands of the Gadigal this week? Really amazing. David, you're a brick, mate. You have done something extraordinary by giving us a platform to allow our voice to be heard across our sector. So I know on behalf of my fellow countrymen and women that we truly send you a very sincere thank you for allowing this. Um, <laughs> this is going to be a hard one for you guys, but here we go. Namangamanir Tali Naranga, Panji Jaminka, Takli Amiao. That's in the Sydney language, and basically it means we extend a warm embrace and extend our hand in friendship. Well, we had a lot of discussions this week, haven't we, about what theatre is and all the rest. Before I go any further, of course, um, as uh, protocol dictates, we always like to acknowledge and honour those custodians, resistance fighters, and our family who went before us and created legacies for us to live up to. I would uh, like to ask that all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island First Nations people in the, in the audience, would they mind standing for me for a moment? Thank you. And could Uncle Jack just remain standing? Because <laughs> you're not going to see him if he sits down. <laughs> um, Uncle Jack, on behalf of our uh, colleagues and peers, we would like to acknowledge that you are one of the custodians of theatre as an elder for us in this industry, and we pay our deep respects to you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> We've had incredible discussions. We've had forums that have stimulated and invited active dialogue rather than us just being the passive observer. We have, social, uh, we have uh, fostered social interaction. We are reimagining what the public cultural realm of First Nations art and interconnected stories can bring, not only to our country and our cultural uh, fibre, but also we are creating invaluable opportunities for our artists from a variety of disciplines so they can gather, meet, discuss, debate and make connections with Australians. Most importantly, we do need to examine our arts practices, the social and political implications they bring and the benefits that a side-by-side -side engagement of working together will tell the nation and indeed Mr Anthony Budgie Smugglers Abbott. <laughs> Um, but just to give you a bit of background about me, my homelands are of the Widgeable, um, our traditional states are that of the Bunjilung Nation, which stretches north across the Queensland border to the Logan River, west to the small towns of Warwick and Bow Desert, south to Tenerfield, and across to the east coast of the town of Iluka. As I mentioned, we're Widgeable. I come from an extraordinary political family of custodial men and women who were involved in what we know as the struggle, living under the Protection Act. My grandfather was the last fully initiated man of the Bunjilung Nation. And in the 1950s, his wisdom words uh, about living on our occupied lands would have a profound effect on our lives. He created a legacy that would determine the Roberts family future. Grandfather Lyle made three points. Retain pride of race and colour retain identity and language, and consider other people to make the best of life. He worked side by side with many whites in the uh, region of northern New South Wales. My father, the late Frank Roberts, also took on the legacy. He worked with many people that became the pioneers of the work I was about to enter when I entered the arts. Many of them changed my nappies when I was children. It was nothing unusual for me to wake up and see Faith Bandler, Ujuru Nunakul, Kevin Gilbert, and various others at our breakfast table. Sir Pastor Doug Nichols, the first premier, Aboriginal Premier of South Australia, 
quite incredible. I grew up surrounded by extraordinary people who spoke of language, who talked about political uprising in a time when their children could have been taken and they could have been locked up for merely singing a language song. Where we grew up was indeed a racist hotbed. It has grown over the last few years. No longer does my 13-year-old young girl, Sarah, have to question the pool attendant about being checked. When I was at the pool in the early 70s in high school, when you went on the weekend, you weren't allowed into the swimming pool. And when you went with the school, all the Aboriginal children had to be checked. Now, you've got to bear in mind that the swimming pool attendant was in sixth form, or year 12, I think, as it's known now. When you're a young girl growing up on the Northern Rivers, all you want to be is a Byron Bay surfy chick with Chico Rolls and watching the surfers out on their boards. So I questioned this young man, got kicked out of the swimming pool, of course, was terrified to go home because I knew that I would get in trouble for doing a Charlie Perkins. If you spoke out, a lot of the old people would say, hey, what are you doing a Charlie Perkins for? You'll get yourself into trouble. Don't be a troublemaker. I got home and my father applauded me and I realised that he wanted me to speak out. At times, I was just too shy. And now I walk across our town. I'm currently working with Northern Rivers Performing Arts and it's incredibly exciting that they too are committed to the local region. And I take them down to the new parklands that have been developed and there are grandfather's Lyle's words for all to see, for all to learn, for all to grow with, on the very place where our ancestors had gathered and hunted to feast on the native fowl. When I asked David what would I talk about for this um, discussion, he said, oh, just tell a bit about yourself. And I went, oh, my God, you have no idea. This is really nerve-wracking one because you're all my colleagues and I admire you all so incredibly. But... I come from a time where if you spoke about yourself, you were big noting. It's not the thing you do. And so it's often been quite difficult to actually say the I instead of the we or the me or the us. And so um, please forgive me if I sound a bit all over the place because I don't like really talking about that sort of thing because we come from a community that has the greatest regard for the tall poppy syndrome. I want to talk about the Australian arts sector <laughs> and why we all have a passion and a desire to work in this such a challenging industry, particularly with this um, current government. Now, this is Brian Siren. He was indeed a dreamer and he was a doer. He was also my teacher. And he had a 30-year vision when he returned from teaching with Stella Adler at, in the United States of America. He was instrumental in developing and nurturing myself, Lydia Miller, and Ernie Dingo. He taught us so many lessons in class. And if I'm ever working on a production now, I can still hear him and the mantra that he would continually talk about. He was tough. And there were many times his barbed words would have us close to tears. And we wondered why, particularly Lydia and I, we wondered why we had given up a career as double certificate nursing sisters to step onto the stage. Because <laughs> when you're a nurse, people love you. They thank you for saving their life. Um, but it's extraordinary how many nurses moved into the arts. Because when you're a nurse, you really have to look at your administration of your patient. You have to look at priorities. Because if you fuck up, they die. <laughs> so you're pretty clear about what your priorities are on your daily basis. <laughs> and so we brought that with us, I think, when we started in the arts. And Brian told us it would be a minefield. He would teach us many things. Chekhov, Tennessee Williams, extraordinary stories of his experiences and what we could do on the stage. And he'd always go, go back, close your eyes, smell it, hear it, see it, think it, and only last and last you, you say it. And it, it is a constant thing that when I'm working, I think about. 
Uh, he wanted us to have a shield. He said, otherwise you will never cope in the minefield that is the arts. They will attack you, both from the black and the white sectors. And most importantly, he told us about mediocrity. There is nothing mediocre about our, our culture. And it's interesting, I was talking with the extraordinary young Soper yesterday, um, and he too was telling me that his father said exactly the same to him as a young Samoan boy, there is nothing mediocre in our culture. Brian was right. There would be an element of lateral violence on a regular basis. It has increased over the years because our people have been so disenfranchised. I don't think they're attacking us on a personal level. I actually think it comes down to that we just become the sounding board because they have no other outlet. I've had some pretty good ones, uh, a few police investigations. Um, the, the, the human faeces on the doorstep was a doozy. Uh, that was me rushing off to work and um, with the pram, baby in arms, another one on the, you know, in the backpack on the back, and uh, bang, into the dog shit. Well, that started the day good. I wondered how I could deal with the letters of abuse the physical abuse. I've been king hit, I've been uh, attacked, I've been strangled simply because I didn't put an act on. But they are all lessons. You see, we have a craft and a technique. And Brian told us we had to learn it three times better than anyone else just to work in this industry. After all, he said, the creative sector is bigger than us. It's not about the individual. We will be the vessels, we will be enablers. And he was so right. Now, a lot of you might know, but Brian Sign returns to Australia in the 70s. He's done this huge amount of um, repertoire and travel across the states as they do in the summer season. And he was instrumental in developing, in the 1970s, the Australian National Playwrights Conference. He would later go on to develop the inaugural National Black Playwrights Conference. It was held in Canberra in the 80s, and it was extraordinary. We got to work with people that were our heroes. It was a time where we were able to have healthy debate to look at the future, the longevity of our industry, and we were questioning many issues, the ones we're still talking about. Who were we writing for? Was there space in the mainstream? Were we providing a platform, political, social and economical development of our people? Who was brave enough to stand on the ledge and take a risk? Question, would we be brave to do dangerous stories? Could we write about the many taboos, the domestic taboos, the cultural taboos? And these list of playwrights were our pioneers. And they sat down with us throughout those two weeks. Most of them have passed on. I can't tell you what it was like to sit in front of these people that I had grown up with, knowing, and the extraordinary legacies that they had done in a time where living under the Act was almost intolerable for many Aboriginal people. So towards the end of the Playwrights Conference, of course, you know, Aboriginal people got to have outcomes, got to have a committee, got to do... Anyway, so they decided they would select a number of Aboriginal people who they would give a list to. Well, I was selected because they knew my family. My father was the chair of FACATSI, the organisation that brought us the 67 referendum. They picked Lydia Miller. Her father was Mick Miller. He'd written one of the most extraordinary reports in the 70s, the Miller Report, a scathing attack on the government's policies. Her mother was Pat O'Shane. And then the late Vivian Walker was selected. He'd spent 10 years in New York as well. He was the most incredible director I've ever worked with. And he was the son, the youngest son, of Nana Walker, also known as Ujuru Nunakul. And then they handed us the mantle. That's pretty amazing. We were wet behind the ears. We didn't know what we were doing. But they had faith in us because they knew we came from such families of political excellence in this country. Now, the list was pretty interesting, uh, to say the least. If I look at it now, I go, holy shit, what were we thinking? Our patrons were, of course, my absolute idol, Justine Saunders. Oh, 
I'll get to that, sorry. It's gone too far. Uh, Justine Saunders. Uh, Nana Walker was a patron, and of course, Brian Siren. So the list was, you have to develop and incorporate a theatre company, the Aboriginal National Theatre Trust. You have to put on three productions, and you have to convene the second National Black Playwrights Conference. Okay, well, we did four productions. We didn't only develop the second National Black Playwrights Conference, Lydia went on to do the third. And it was instrumental in establishing a lot of the writers' works that we saw over the last decade. It was amazing, incredible, scary, frightening. We set up an office in Newtown and away we went. The first conference was in Canberra, the second National Black Rights Co Playwrights Conference was at Macquarie University. I don't think you can see all the faces, can you? Amazing how we were all so skinny. But get a load of Stephen Page up there. Let me see if I can find him. He's next to Lydia. Look at that, would you? <laughs> Quite a lot of people there. It's surprising. I went through that and got really sad at the number of people who've passed away. So at that Playwrights Conference, we, were, we as young people thought we could do it all, it was idealism. And so we had play readings, but we also went, you know what? We're going to block it, we're going to perform it, all in the space of two weeks, God help us. <laughs> but the thing that we closed on was an interesting. We'd asked for submissions, we knew there might not be playwrights out there, so people sent poems, songs, stories, little snippets of information, letters. And then we received this big yellow manila folder. And inside, as we emptied it, they're all bits of paper, serviettes, blotting paper, fool's cap paper, scrap paper. And on those bits of paper were 52 songs. And I was reading it and I recognised some of the songs. There's a band at the time in Broome called Cuckles. And the lead singer, Jimmy Chai, who was, wrote, just wrote songs all the time. So the last thing we did at the second Black Playwrights Conference, we put a group of actors together, Ernie Dingo, Cl Lawrence Clifford, uh, Kylie Belling, Lydia Miller, uh, uh, um, uh, Francis Little, uh, and I'm sorry if I've forgotten anyone else. And we sat them down with the 52 songs, and they sat with playwrights such as Jack Davis, Ujuru Nunnuckle, et cetera, et cetera, and worked out what the dialogue would be between the songs. And on that last night, as we developed a church scene that had you falling in the aisles, if any of you have grown up with Christianity, and people talking in spirits. And it was funny, it was great. And Jimmy Chai stood on the stage and he said, oh my God, I have a play. It's a brand new day. Pretty, yeah. And that's what conferences can do. But we couldn't have done that on our own. It was the dreamers and the doers that enabled us. And I do need to mention them. When we set up Ant, we so wanted to put on productions in a venue in Sydney. However, at the time, Sydney wasn't ready for us. The performance space did offer us an opportunity, but we didn't want to perform on the fringe. We wanted to be in the mainstream. Belvoir Street didn't allow Aboriginal work unless it was directed by a non-Aboriginal director. They didn't have faith that you could have an all Aboriginal production. I'm talking the late 80s here. And so a young woman from Melbourne by the name of Sue Natras invited us down. She saw our treatment of the work and so we started doing our performances at the Victorian Arts Centre, often extending them and selling out. And then things were to change very quickly in Sydney because a new general manager joined Belvoir Street by the name of Christine Westwood. I knew her because I'd been working at ABC Radio at that time on Radio National on a feminist program called In The Mix. It was brilliant, actually. And, um, and that's where I'd met Chris. And so when she got into Belvoir, she said, oh my God, this is ridiculous. And so she opened a space for us to do our performances there. It was a whole new era. But none of it would have never happened. We would never have been on that stage in the costumes, because it was Auntie Wendy Blacklock, and she truly deserves to be so honoured in our industry. 
you know, when you think back in the 70s and 80s, she really was daring about putting on Aboriginal work and touring it around the world with Jack Davis's plays. But she provided the costume. She was down at the Elizabethan Theatre Trust. And she's like, all right, darlings, what do you need, you know? <laughs> and she really, really, truly was amazing. Then Belvoir Street got someone else, Robin Kershaw, dynamic, creative, visionary. The world had indeed changed. <laughs> so, oh, you slide, I better move on. Am I boring you? <laughs> <laughs> like this. Uh, 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 number nine or six. I don't know, I think she did take a gear off. But, <laughs> I love this headline. Can you see it? I read it out. Justine Saunders. Girl breaks the colour barrier. <laughs> <laughs> so colourblind colour blind casting has been talked about forever. She was my hero. She still is. Can you imagine? You grow up, you don't have a TV. I'd go to Vicky Slattery's house <laughs> <laughs> to watch the, ma the, the landing of the moon because we didn't have a TV. And then Dad got a second hand one from somewhere and we thought we were flash. And so the only thing we were allowed to watch was Bill Peach on this day tonight. <laughs> and the theme music, but I won't. And then came Pig in a Poke. And it came on at 8.30, I think. That was really late after we said our prayers and went to bed. So we were allowed to sit up and watch this television show because it's got an Aboriginal in it. So I grew up with this woman then to be working side by side. Oh my God, it was incredible. She broke down, she accessed those doors for us. And she used to laugh at us and go, yeah, you, you know, I made a career out of being raped, prostituted, killed. I was the absolute mission gym. And we, <laughs> she used to say it. And we used to go for auditions. And at the time, there were a handful of actors. There was Jetta Cole, Kylie Belling, Lynette Narkel, Lillian Crombie, Lydia and I. And we get to an audition and all of us were there. Go, oh, well, Justine, you get the old auntie bit, we'll get the young girl. And, you know, you have a grandmother bit, you could be the central desert woman. <laughs> and we just all stand there and go, actually, if one of us gets it, fantastic. That's how it was. So we were making it in the arts. We had lots of support, we had lots of net, uh, networks, and we were getting pretty brave and confident. We realised then, as we headed towards the next Playwrights Conference, it was time for us to hand the mantle. And so Aboriginal National Theatre Trust was handed over to Lillian Crombie and Susie Bart. Sadly, the company folded three months later. But it was a very valuable lesson for all of us. That's when we started to examine, really examine our practice, challenge our perceptions, look at the gaps, demand honest critiquing. I went back to making TV and documentaries and then working on a new show. Together with the late Gavin Jones, amazing man, we talked about a national radio program. So we established Five Australia. We put together a radio show called Deadly Sounds, it's been running for 21 years, about to come back in February. We put together, I always wanted our own AFI, so I thought that could be pretty, because black fellas just love to get flash and dressed up, and I think there's nothing more than acknowledging your peers. And so we put together the Deadlies. We put together a magazine and we started doing events around the country. It was incredible to have that confidence and work with a broader sector. We started to look at who was writing the stories, what stories were being told, were they truthful, were they from spirit and place, were we, were we really addressing the trauma of the nation, the heartache, were we exposing the generosity of spirit, were we maintaining the oldest living race on the planet? <coughs> you see, Richard mentioned yesterday that we possibly go to about 15 funerals. I went to 22 last year. The last four were all my cousins. Most of them were a year or two years younger than me. It made me sit up and go, Jesus, look at that. I have so got to lose weight. <laughs> That's my goal for this year. <laughs> and then I realised seeing the passing of so many elders. Every time custodian passes on, we lose another library. 
we do have to take the reins. We do have to look at the authenticity and authorship of the works, but we have to get it written down. It is so important. We are Australians. We are host to the oldest living race on the planet. Nobody else has what we have. We should be shouting from the rooftops. Look at that. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I should have said at the beginning for Aboriginal people. I do apologise. There are some images here of the deceased, and I'm really sorry. I completely forgot. You can work with it. I don't care. This was. Um, we started to move into multimedia, and you know, um, yes. So uh, Richard mentioned um, the AFC and his brother, Paul Saunders, who went to work there. Well, it was originally set up with the idea of um, training over a period of time filmmakers or you know, people working in that particular sector. Jimmy Everett from Tasmania actually established it when he established the ABC Cadetship <coughs> Unit. Um, and then he moved to the Australian Film Commission and then Paul Saunders came and took over and we saw Sad to Sell Lord and every year we'd see a different series. This was one of the series, it won a golden tripod, and it was by a deceased artist, the late Michael Riley, whose work now stands in the Musée de Quai Bromley in Paris. He was extraordinary. He was completely before his time, and offered so many opportunities. And it was this that led to something very important in both Lydia and my life, and Rachel's life in particular. But he died. from renal dialysis. He hadn't even hit his peak, and he was dead. And of course, our brother there also passed. Extraordinary talent that carried extraordinary loads. So Michael showed us what we could do with multimedia. He challenged images. Uh, this was about, so interesting, none of the issues have ever changed. This was called Poison. And of course, it was about a group of Aboriginals getting into the current drug of the day, which I think was smack. <coughs> Lydia was a smack addict. Um, then we got brave. Hey, <laughs> listen, uh, I was 34 there. I was the oldest of all of them. <laughs> and I played the youngest. <laughs> Then when she did come home, she kept bloody getting pregnant. 
Um, oh my god, I can't tell you how many abortion clinics I talked to. But anyway, um, at the time I just got married and so she was pregnant again. Welfare came in to take her child. And I will give you a scenario because I do call them Department of Child Snatchers, but sometimes they do have to take the children. She just had a baby, she's got a bag hanging in her mouth, a cup of tea, and she's breastfeeding, the baby's low. Seriously, darling, you can't have a bag in your hand while you're breastfeeding your kid. You've really got to, I fucking want a cigarette, she'll be right. And I said, the welfare lady's coming now, darling. Uh, you've really got to get this kid off your tea. And when welfare saw it and said, oh, she can't manage that child. And luckily, my mother realised there was a new policy at the time. Because it wasn't until 1989 that Aboriginal people would actually even adopt or that they could foster legally. So, you know, because we can't look after our children, of course. And so my mother jumped up and said, oh, the new policy, my daughter will take the niece as Aboriginal life dictates and she will raise her. So Bill and I stayed up all night and worked out the pros and cons of how we take this baby. And we did, and it was wonderful. Um, so, yeah, I had her in a little carry thing, I just shove her on the thing while it's reversing, it's quite interesting. <laughs> 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 I just want that fact to the At the same time, things were moving in our community here. My father had always talked, because I'd always wanted to be a journalist, and I had a teacher, Mr John Muldoon, and I'd say I'm standing here because of John Muldoon. And um, he told me I could be anything I wanted and that I could actually write. And um, he pushed, pushed me. But when I came home and said I wanted to go to university because I wanted to be a writer, uh, some in the family sort of said I was getting high, who was giving me these highfalutin ideas? And what sort of um, print media would employ an Aboriginal journalist? And of course, at the time, Little did we know that in the 50s, Mervyn Bishop was, of course, working for the Herald with his images. And the late Mr Kennedy, of course, was doing the police round. So we did have journalists working at the time, but we didn't know it. So my dad had always talked this dream of, don't worry, darling, we'll start a newspaper. <laughs> well, he bloody well did. <laughs> it was called the Quarry Mail. Yeah. <laughs> And I've got a t-shirt, one of the original t-shirts in this bag of all these original t-shirts. I've got all the play rights conferences and I've never worn them and they just go with me from house to house. And the first t-shirt was yellow with brown and it had an Aboriginal man and underneath it's got Koori Mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, that was pretty amazing. He brought in young people to run that. It did really well. Um, but unfortunately, it must be something about Northern Rivers. Couldn't get any government funding to keep the paper going. So he went to the seven missions that exist in our community. And each one of them put up two grand to keep the paper going. A few years back, it made 1.3 million. So it was the anniversary of the Kuru Mau, one year. And so Dad put on a big conference. And it was to discuss what Aboriginal people could be writing about. Could we be making documentaries about domestic violence? Or could we be making documentaries like Stupid He Did? about our legal service. You see, at the time, we had a legal service set up in the 70s because so many Aboriginal people were being incarcerated. But they had a policy. They couldn't do black on black. So a decade later, when all these women are sitting, living in terrible situations and wanting to get ABOs on their husbands because they've been so brutalised and they were disenfranchised and taken their power out on the women, the women had to go to legal aid while the men were defended by the legal service. So stupid did a story on it, didn't I? was the first king hit I got. I went to Hasn't do... Hasn't changed. Eh? Hey? Hasn't changed. No. I can't do black on black. No, I can't do black on black. So I went and did a story and I tried to do the... You know, I tried to be brave. Put the foot in the door. Oh, please, can you have a comment? And they went, you fuck, come back here, cunt, and we'll punch you out. So I went up the laneway, shaking like a leaf, ringing my father, crying, and he said, you do what you have to do. You want to climb that mountain, darling? You're going to fall down some crevices, but one day you're going to get to the top. And then I got King Hint. Um, <laughs> anyway, so Dad thought this would be wonderful at the conference to bring this little nice moment up. So I showed the documentary, and all the men, bar one, stood up, and the men we all know, and it nearly killed me to see my colleagues 
And one of them said, listen sis, you want to know how black women are treated? We'll take you outside now. Shut up, why are you showing white people this about us? In hindsight, I can see why I should have dealt with it differently, if I'd been maybe a little bit wiser. I can see why he was saying, did you do, you know, I've made a few mistakes and perhaps you should have talked to a few more people. So we have the anniversary, and my father gets up to give the keynote speak. He was the only man that remained in the room, by the way. I'm crying, and there was a ball that night, and we were going home um, to get changed, and you know, boy, this one did really well that week, because every black fellow in town had gone high, you know, the, the penguin suit, and they were all at our house, and everyone was coming home to change, and I said, oh, I'm not going. Dad said, what? I said, oh, there's no way I'm going. Those men there, there's no way, Dad, I'm not going out. I said, I thought you were a Roberts. <laughs> ah, that must be the white blood in you then. Um, <laughs> and made me go. And I'm so pleased to did, because I walked up, Dad, you know, keep, keep the honey close, the enemy. I just walked up and hugged all those men. And said, don't worry, brother, I understand. In my mind, I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> the next morning I got a call, I just flew back to Sydney, got into Sydney and got a 4 a.m. call from my mother. What are you doing, Frank, she said as she woke up and looked at her bed. He was standing in the doorway, he fell down and dropped dead. He had an incredible walk in his life. He was 74 years old, pretty good for a black fellow on the mission, you know, living on rations. He had diabetes, he was almost blind. And now when I reflect, I remember looking at him thinking, because I'm always diagnosing people, it doesn't leave you when you're a nurse. And I'm thinking, oh my God, he's got fucking Parkinson's, I could see the shuffle. So in a way, it was great that Dad dropped dead there, like with integrity and dignity and, and all that, but it nearly killed me, nearly killed me. But amazingly, all of a sudden, it was like something was given to me. I all of a sudden felt really centred. I never started being as vulnerable or doubting what I was doing. And it was this book that I read during that very sad period of time. If Everyone Cared, Margaret Tucker. Now, I think Richard mentioned Auntie yesterday. She was the most extraordinary woman she was a ukulele player, she was a really amazing um, political savvy woman back in the 20s and the 30s. If you ever get the opportunity to see the film Lousy Little Sixpence, please do. She tells about her mother being, uh, her being taken on the day. And of course she was raised on the mission, she had, by the mission manager lady, she had this incredibly thick English accent, beautiful. Such dignity and grace. Yeah. I better move on to something nicer now. Look at Billy. What a mother. <laughs> Most extraordinary man and indeed a decade of a challenging relationship, but just wonderful. This man, you know, how many people know that Bill actually started life as an Olympic swimmer? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yes. Trained with John Conrads and Sandy, the one in Melbourne. So Bill was, that's how it started life, he was just into swimming and he, you know, the Melbourne Games were on in 58, had the green blazer somewhere. Anyway, he was this great swimmer, he was breaking all these records, had good personal times and it's amazing, like years later he became a member of the icebergs. Now he had the beer gut and everything, but honestly it was like a sheer beauty to watch him swim. <laughs> um, so he all of a sudden wakes up after a particular race. He were had men, men in, oh, I can't, now I'm a nurse, I can't say it. We had, went into a coma, a meningococcal coma. Woke up six weeks later and his career was over. He would never swim again. He didn't know what he was going to do. He never drank, he never smoked. So he went to his local where he'd always trained and became a coach, a hip rock, partied and did a lot what our young swimmers do now. <laughs> and then they needed an extra for on the beach. And you did have an affair with Eva Gardner. Uh, so Greg Peck, I think it was. 
And then if so, a body double for him to swim out past St Kilda's jetty. And that's Bill when you watch that film. And he was watching, and he thought it was a mug's game. He watched this guy do 27 takes to say something. And he said, it's recreating a circumstance in extraordinary circumstances. So he just watched people. Next minute, he's over in England doing rap and, and creating a career. But there was a young man who was really interested in called Phil Noyce. He wanted to make films. So Bill, the late Zach Martin, one of our great actors, and Gary Foley decided they could do a road movie. And this would be Phil Noyce's chance of directing a film. Back roads. Oh my god, I hated being the tour manager on that one. Uh, so life goes on, doesn't it? This man taught me so much. I'm absolutely indebted. Um, and of course, he was there when big things were happening in the country with the Olympics and various other things. Um, I don't think I could have done or put up with it without him. And his network in the Aboriginal community, because he used to hang out with the Black Theatre Mob and all the long grass mob, he had such, they had such incredible respect for, for Bill. And uh, many nights sitting there listening to the old days and the political talks. So, surprisingly, it grew me. Now, okay, he was 52, I was 34, so you know, it wasn't a big difference. <laughs> so I get the Lippy Arts Festival, that would be amazing. 1997, I start the dreaming, I get to work at the Olympics, and it was a really scary thing. Half the community go, to, what, Olympics? Why should we have to put ourselves on show to show that this nation is such a lovely, lovely place to live when we still have policies and inadequacies and inequality? It was a hard one. But then I saw the budget and what they wanted. And <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
seven women's players we looked at commissioning. Um, Box the Pony, young girl I'd met, uh, Gavin Jones and I had actually met her at an ADOC thing in the mid late 90s. And um, she was a singer with Dreadbox, great singer, amazing little band. Um, and so we were so struck by a song we heard called Run Daisy Run. And we asked this young woman, would she come into the studio and record it? I mean, we had tears running down our faces. At the same time, ABC, uh, the long way to ABC, well, SBS had been doing it, and ABC was a little slow, and um, they put a show called Blackout. And they wanted to do a massive launch, but they wanted something different. And we went, hey, we've got someone for you. We met this young girl, her name's Leah Purcell. And of course she came and sang that song, and then of course she got to acting and all that. And so, Box the Pony, I think, was one of her first major works. And uh, it was wonderful to be able to commission and see works that would have a life and make sure they did. There were many. Um, Vivian Jara Pinjara is coming to the Opera House is 21 years old. Another work we um, gave money to get up and, and run. At the same time, Lydia Miller was running uh, the Australian Council for the Arts, the Aboriginal Unit, and she was trying really hard because they were trying to mainstream. It was the era of mainstream. Uh, we started from the did go, we want to be mainstream, and all of a sudden they were trying to mainstream all the organisations, and we were going, no. Um, and just as I was getting excited about this, I opened in Sydney Theatre Company, we did a Shakespeare piece, people were raving, it was all wonderful, it was exciting. Carolyn Brown was telling me I was a cultural leader. And I got a phone call. And my sister had been brutally murdered. Oh, no, sorry, I didn't know that. My sister, I kept going, I am mad, right? I'm identical twin, right? So you've got to have some psychic thing. So I get this call that my sister I was missing. So I go and sit out at the gap, <laughs> thinking there's going to be a psychic moment that's going to didn't happen. Um, so I had to go home because, you know, it's funny, death is so final, but you've always got to look at why. You've got to learn those lessons and then you've got to treasure, just treasure what you have. And there's always a hole, you know. But if you can take those lessons, it does give you that shield that Brian, all those years ago, talked about. It does give you strength in a funny, funny way. It takes a while. So anyway, my brother goes down to the police station. And remember, you know, this one's pretty racist. And if you're Roberts, you're a black of the mission. And you're probably responsible for every break in and murder in the town. So my brother, of course, you know, as most families have, was a substance abuser and had been known to the police. And so he was, went down to put missing persons, but of course he was too scared because they didn't take him seriously. Because my sister had had a car accident at that time, um, brain trauma wasn't known of the extent that happens when you have serious head injuries. And so there were often times she was inappropriate in her behaviour, in her dress, and she found warmth and comfort in our community. The custodial lands, I'm sure you've heard of Nimbin Rocks. Those three rocks are our immediate family's custodial lands. We're so responsible for them. Hey, we've got the hippies. Um, but they were extraordinary. They welcomed her, they didn't judge her. She was part of the community out there. So the papa said, Mummy, she just got walk about. She's just out there bonking someone. She'll come back into town to, tomorrow or something. I said, I don't think you understand the seriousness of what this officer. And he said, Rhoda, Roberts, you've got to remember, you're just a black chin off the mission. Don't you go giving honor things with me. I said, I'm sorry, officer. Oh, constable. <laughs> I'm sure it didn't help the investigation, but you know. <laughs> You see, my sister had been banned. Can you believe this? Hey, this is black fellow, so he's a great one. She gets banned from the local locker. <laughs> 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 Worked really well. 
uh, because she would just torment them with her incredible mom and challenge them questions continuously all night and they would shut up. <laughs> most extraordinary event, the biggest thing to happen in my life. I'm married, I'm raising her child, things are pretty tough, I'm getting attacked, I've stopped, you know, trying the dog shit, and I know something's happened to my sister because head injury victims, or, well, you know, patients, are very habitual, and she had an access to her bank account, and I just knew. So, it's a terrible thing when you don't know what's happened. But I knew something. Anyway, years later we would find out. Six months later, we would get the call that her body had been found. And of course, this is a decade later, and we're about to head into the 2000 Olympics. And my relationship breaks up, and lots of things. So, three years earlier, I'd gone to a place called the Kimberley, and amazing. I am so lucky. I am blessed. I am so blessed to work in this. I could go to any community around this country and people embrace me. And I get taught so much. I just hope I can give it back. Oh God, there's the eye, I'm sorry. Um, but I mean, oh, five minutes. I mean, okay. <laughs> Don't even look good. I'll get over the, sorry. <laughs> okay, so Donnie Bulaguja is a man in the Kimberley. He has extraordinary spirit. He is the custodian of Namra Lily. For him to give us her and to raise her across the globe was a huge thing for him. You know, he had to ensure that it would be looked after, that her spirit would be done in the right collaboration with the right dialogue and message. She braced our paths and she went across the world and we knew anything was possible. After I'd done the Olympics, I realised, surprisingly, that Australians actually did want to get to know us. They wanted to have experiences. So I started to realise that it was festivals we needed. In festivals, we could have theatre, we could have music, we could have dance, we could revitalise language, Revitalise the old kinship practices. It was a gathering. It could be everything or anything we wanted. And so I started Sydney Dreaming, which we ran. Of course, we wanted to make it bigger. We wanted to have camping. We wanted people to experience and, and side by side sit around the fire and, and tell their stories. Because Sydney, yet again, God bless their little soul, wasn't ready for any Aboriginal to think they could produce a festival on their own. Um, and they refused us. We tried Cockatoo Island, we are out at Sopa, nobody wanted it, they didn't want blacks descending on their regions, I guess. And so, fortunately, um, we moved to Woodford and we took Sydney Dreaming as the Dreaming to Woodford. In seven years, we would see an increase in the employment of the actors, so I think we had 2,000 in the last year, I did, um, 28,000 people coming through the gates. We developed so many programs. When I first started the Dream in 97, we started a schools program for our opening ceremony with 2,000 students from across high schools. And you have no idea when you teach a young man who feels invisible in society, and you teach him a shake and eat something that's important to his culture, and you teach them a local chant, like Namagam and the Italian Naranga, and they can sing it, they walk around and yeah, I'm Aboriginal. Oh yeah, I know a bit of language. I can dance. You have no idea what it gives them. It's extraordinary. And through the dream, we ran this program. And 17 years later, I would see one young man who influ influences me on a daily basis. He teaches me so much. It's extraordinary. Um, and he was a young 15-year-old running amok in the school's program. I was going to kill him. So he's gorgeous, and I could see that he had something. Could see something there. So many of the kids from the opening program would then hear about Maystar. And surprisingly, many, many of them went to Maystar. But this young man, who I think was 15 when he first came on the schools program, hadn't danced. 
Went to Navestown. A year later, I was working at Bangara. Two years later, Sydney Opera House. And that's Travis Trevides. Keep an eye out for him because I'll tell you what, to see young people that were on Sainsbury, all these amazing young people that are starting to come into our industry and affect us, we have to listen to them. They've got great vision. And I see us all handing the mantle again. And it just makes me feel so, so great. Collaboration is the most important thing we can do. Scotland, New Zealand, Australia, Boomerang Project, went to the Commonwealth Games, created a great dialogue with three arts companies, created New Zealand, Australia Council for the Arts, and created Scotland. We're going to hopefully get this back up in 2016. Amazing. But it was all about side by side, fusion and collaboration. We have to look at capacity building. It's really, really important. So many of our artists, and everyone, and Blackfellas in here know how I am, and, and lots of people hate me for this. Oh, please, if you're going to work with the community, great. But if you're going to do a project, do you go and get the CWA lady to give you advice on work? No, you don't. <laughs> you get the right person. So when you come into the regional communities, where many of our artists have returned back on country, and have expertise, why do you go to our version of the CWA to ask them about theatre instead of going to the expertise in the community? Please, I die every week when I see another artist leave our industry. We have to upskill. We have to look at other ways that they can be involved. Three young musicians, amazing. George Street Warriors, Casey Donovan, Troy Brady. Great songwriters. So we took a pun. Playwright in Australia, wherever you are, thank you. Great partnership. It's a friendship, it's a relationship. God help us when we get married, but <laughs> they took this on because they are the expertise of doing labs. Hey, would you take three musicians, see if they can write a story? Don't care if there's no outcome, we just need to really give confidence to these people. Troy's story about being on chemotherapy. Casey's story in the destruction of Idol and uh, social network bullying. Street Warriors, 19th century, civil war that existed in New South Wales, Wales and why we are a matriarchal society. Poor old uh, Silas of Wiradjuri didn't have any women. Invaded the Mill Road Bajalung. God bless him. I'm at the Opera House. Festivals are so important. Do we do free events? Does that devalue our work? How do we engage our own communities? They'll go to the football, but they bloody won't come to us. Because in their day, culture wasn't allowed. We really have to get together and work out how we market programs, how we engage our local communities. And Blackfellas, 40,000 go and see the All Stars. And we're trying to get 10 people to come and see Mangara, for God's sake. Yes, whites are coming. But we also want to bring our own communities on the right. So we really have to get quite effective. We have to be strategic. This is a free event. In two or three years, we'll hopefully we'll have that audience. We're looking at taking another challenge at the moment. There's lots of fusion dance work. It's wonderful. Congratulations. It's amazing. Dance is like the visual <coughs> arts now. It's well known. Well, you know, renowned. But what happens to the, the traditional stories, the, the manor case, the original farewell of welcome songs, the original steps? Oh, gee, that's our classic work. What are we going to do in 30 years? Oi, 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 we're going to have great football in but we're going to have no culture. Closing the gap does not have one thing for culture. So we're going to revitalise it. We. We're going to bring a dance competition in, and we're going to teach our people and link them with the National Film Archives. Get our footage out, show them, and bring back the corroborates. So our young people, in 50 years, their children can also sing the welcome song. And I'll leave it on this. Now, I'm sorry, I, I really ran out of time, I'm sorry, but I'm now so committed to festivals. They are the gatherings, we really need them. Both all Australians, but indeed our own people need them for their well-being. It is a time to gather when there is no funeral. Although, I can't tell you how many people 
want to come to the draining to die. Um, and they did. Um, but, so I go to the East Coast, because I want to do, all my aunties go, hey, you do a festival everywhere else around the world. You do Woodford, you do Garma, salt water, etc., etc. Why are you doing one in your own country? So Boomerang, on the Byron Bay Blues Festival site. We think it's a great idea. Byron Bay is known as the festival. In fact, we're bloody 10 minutes out of Byron. I think the council, behind their green facade, are terrified that blacks are going to descend on their little <laughs> habitat there. Peter Noble, I go to him, we talk for two or three years, can't get any funding. Jenny Macklin says, what's the relevance on the East Coast? We've got Corumba and Garma. Why do you need a festival? Well, we bloody do, we're the first contact point, and our culture is alive and well on the East Coast. <laughs> Absolutely. So I sell everything, everything I own. To get this happening. And they tell me it's not relevant. I go everywhere. Everyone says no. And I don't get it. They tell me to move it to the territory and not fund me. I try to be ethical about sponsorship. I get offered an anonymous donation from an individual that I ethically could not take money from. Other arts companies have, and no one says a thing. But I can tell you if I did it, I'd be crucified. So I go, okay, I'm sorry, I shouldn't get it like this. Oh, well, that's life, isn't it? Looks like we won't be able to do the festival, Pete, but we'll work on something, you know? And he goes, I can't believe this. Fuck them. And he digs into his pocket, his own personal pocket, remortgages his house, and gives me the million it'll take to do this festival. Four and a half thousand people turn up. We do extraordinarily well. Local business makes over 10 million in the local region. It's fantastic. We're going again, but we still can't get funding. I've got to learn how to do crowdsourcing. I've got to switch my thinking and, you know, work out ways of getting investors. And so, come along for the ride and the journey. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Well, I'm really sorry. This is so stupid. Rachel got upset. Richard got upset. <laughs> <laughs> we don't cry. <laughs>